So hello everyone, um, this is the extended or deep version of the World War II ship guide and I welcome here Justin. Hello everyone. Who is the naval expert for the channel. Uh, he has a master's in history, specialization in military history and intelligence, if I'm correct. Yep. We take a look at basically my video and expand on it oh i also should add that justin and asumasi helped a bit out on the script so corrected some errors there or provided further information and well let's hop in as always i started with an accuracy warning so i started with placement and complement is there anything you want to add from your side here um i think you've got it pretty pretty good as is um for anyone that is ever looking at naval stuff in various sources, uh, one thing you very quickly discover is that you're, you're not often going to find like complement and displacement numbers coincide. And that's like due to a whole number of things like with complement, you know, as you mentioned, I think you mentioned it in the video between the difference between a flagship and uh, something that isn't flagship, you're going to lose people on the complement or sometimes people are just somehow using their numbers differently. Uh, displacement gets even more complicated, and then when you're looking at some sources that don't specify what kind of ton they're using, uh, that can be very frustrating. I mean, sometimes it's inferred, like for example, if anyone is citing standard displacement that should be in long tons because that was like literally part of the, the definition for standard displacement. Uh, other times when they start using another type of displacement. Like maximum. It, yeah, like like maximum, which I assume they mean full deep load, which some sources combine. Other sources say they're distinct. Yeah, like, I, I, I always I read full and deep load is something different. I read different values, in, I think, in, in Conway's books for the most part. Yeah, it's it's a very complicated subject. Uh, like, you know, I study this Navy stuff all the time, and displacement is still something that drives me nuts sometimes. And then, of course, uh, the... The one thing you um, stumbled across is that because originally you were equating standard and normal, because of course in in normal English speaking, yeah. standard and normal are synonyms. But then in displacements, they're actually two completely different because uh, uh, standard is actually kind of short for the Washington standard displacement because it was a a new type of displacement that was created specifically by the Washington Treaty for a number of important reasons. Uh, when you're going to restrict tonnage on things, you had to take into consideration the interests of all kinds of nations. So for example, the Americans would have been extremely angry if fuel was included in the displacement calculation because they, of course, needed to operate in the Pacific at very long ranges, which means that their ships would be penalized for having extra fuel, whereas somebody operating at shorter ranges, like say uh, the Japanese or you know whoever, the Italians or whatever, uh, they're not using as much of, their, of that displacement in fuel, meaning that their ships could be more capable. And you had all of this like wrestling between the various powers and all of their interests, and what you end up with is standard displacement. Uh, so, so I can actually read the literal definition that is written in the Washington Treaty. So uh, the standard displacement of a ship is the displacement of the ship complete, fully manned, engined, and equipped ready for sea, including all armament and ammunition, equipment, outfit, provisions, and fresh water for the crew, miscellaneous stores, and implements of every description that are intended to be carried in war, but without fuel or reserve feed water on board. So you can see that's like a specific exemption basically you know, shoved in there. Um, to appease the Americans, essentially. So it's a very specific definition, and that's why it's different from normal, uh, which was which predated it. And it's actually caused a lot of problems because, of course, when you create an entirely new type of displacement, then you start writing up design requirements to fit in within that displacement. You cause a lot of problems in the design because you're using a, a new like a new measure that no one has ever done before, which is one of the reasons why, for example, when you look at all the early treaty cruisers, everybody had problems with them. Uh, and then the problems were pretty much directly related to how ambitious the specific power was in their design. So for, you know, for example, the Japanese had probably some of the most problems. The Americans also had tons of problems because they, those two were the ones trying to shove like 
everything into 10,000 ton standard in their cruisers. And they had, of course, a multitude of problems. Yeah, we should also add, you know, back then they had no computers and all the other stuff. So all the calculations and all the other, other problems that could be now probably solved in a few minutes were like the whole engineering. I, I can't imagine. I mean, we're talking about ships here that have 10,000 tons and these are, these are just the cruisers and doing calculations and everything on that. It, it's like mind bogglingly insane, I think. And then yeah, okay, it's crazy. just estimate, okay, how much do we need more? Yeah, exactly. Like the Americans, the, the, uh, the Japanese, let's just pick on them. Uh, the Miyoko class, which was their first kind of treaty cruiser class, it came out overweight simply because the, there were outside factors. The Naval General Staff was shoving more and more and more capability into 10,000 tons that really just could not fit. You know, so everything is new. There's, it's a completely new class of ship. Is that this ten thousand ton, eight inch gun cruiser was, was a very new concept that came out of the Washington Treaty, so they had no real previous experience. I mean, with the Japanese, they had the Furutaka class, which was seventy five hundred tons initially, and so they could kind of scale that up a bit. Uh, but there are some nations that were operating completely in the dark. And I mean, the end result is, I mean, you get something like the Pensacola class where it comes out under design weight. It has top weight issues. It has excessive dispersion problems. It's underprotected. It's got all of these problems. And then you see them, you know, through experience. I mean, subsequent classes, they keep getting better and better. But you could see all of this, these problems, particularly early on through the 1920s. Yeah, then then about the armor values, what would you add here? I mean, I could only in the visual guide provide the maximum armor values. I looked at the convoy of ships and there was usually a range given. But the problem is even if, with the range of the armor value, you don't know which areas of the ship are protected. Mm -hmm. That's like one, one of those cans of worms where, yeah, like it, it is completely prohibitive to really... It, it's very difficult to write out the armor values of a ship and have people understand what it, it's not it's it's far more complicated than like on a tank where you say you know uh 45 millimeters of frontal armor or sloped at 60 or whatever with uh, naval vessels it gets very very complicated because of course these are huge ships there's some parts that so if you say i don't know uh, the the belt is 80 millimeters sure Okay, so it's 80 millimeters there, but then in what part of the ship, uh, what, you know, what constitutes the belt it varies between nations, between ship types, between you know, sometimes the belt, uh, if I remember correctly, the Americans, they did not, the belt did not extend, it, it only protected the machinery spaces, it did not extend to the guns, at least this is on um, early treaty cruisers. So that's just like one example. It's one of those things where you're not going to really accurately represent it without that's literally true. drawing out the uh, yeah the armor scheme, and you can't. You have to do it usually from multiple angles. You have to do a cross section, and then you have to do it, and it's like completely prohibitive for a video like this, which is so yeah. Maximum values are about as good as you're gonna get. Yeah, and assuming that you have the values and and uh, mm -hmm. and all the graphics as well, because yeah, it's yeah. like insane. And that's another thing is uh, often the, the armor schemes, they're layered. You know, I sent you that link yeah. of uh, Nagatos and it's like, <laughs> there's the belt and then behind the belt, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on that uh, just saying, oh, 305 millimeters uh, is hiding, but that's something people would have to just kind of look up. So, yeah, and then the quality of seal as well. And it's like, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We <laughs> forgot that aspect, and then there's something else. <laughs> we'll get comments going, well, what about the steel quality? <laughs> it's like, well, okay. We, we didn't want to, you know, you didn't want to spend 300 hours. I mean, uh, on my on my one really, really good y uh, Yamato reference book, he wrote he writes an entire chapter just methodically breaking down like the, the forging process and everything for very specific and the chemical compounds that make up various types of armor. And it's, it's like, if you want that kind of detail, you have to read one of these yeah. books. You don't, yeah. You don't watch a 20 minute video. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. I mean, in, in comparison, tanks are really simple in comparison to, 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 you know, to ships. 
But even for yeah. tanks, it's extremely oh, complicated. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I only did five factors for my T-34 against the, the Panzer III. And, and basically, I had to stop at a certain point. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it, it would just go on 60, 60 minutes or something. And then I would realize, <laughs> yeah, I still only covered the technical and the tactical aspect and the operational and strategic is not even there, not even close, not even a thought about it. Yeah. And now, finally... Let's look to the first class. Let's look at the battleship. And here we have the HMS Warspite, or if you want to talk about uh, battleships in general. Yeah, so uh, before we get right into it, um, this is where you kind of go, your, your, fam your, your, your now famous quote that naval strategy is build strategy. And it's something that is really important to, to drive into, is that when you see a lot of discussions about people, I don't know, I, I'll pick my favorite punching bag, and that's like, the, oh, why didn't navies all go all in for carriers in like 1920. <laughs> so, well, because carriers weren't developed yet to a sufficient level in 1920. When you look at carrier design, it's they didn't know what they were doing, for one thing. Uh, aircraft were nowhere near as, as capable. They were clearly a supporting element to the battle line. They were not ready to take up the mantle, so to speak, of forming the center, the offensive heart of the fleet. Of course, that would change radically by 1939, 40, 41, but certainly in the 20s. So the, the ultimate point is you can't just scrap your entire Navy, go all in for this new unproven technology. And then, oh no, we have a, a war broke out in 1924, and now we need our navy, except it's a, it's a bunch of experimental ships that can't operate on their own, and it's a horrible disaster, and we lose. Because it, it, these organizations, they need to be thinking, you know, t 10, 20, 30 years down the road, while also thinking, okay, we could have to fight a war tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And also, so, so, I mean, <laughs> you, you need to train everyone. I mean, it, it's not like, ah, hey, you gonna, you're now a pilot, or... <laughs> Or, or, or the other gunner, and and you gotta repair the, the biplane, okay? I mean, I think that the German army was basically, we need to least, at least train the guys for two years. And we're talking about machine guns here, okay? And mm -hmm. and Navy stuff is always, navies were always very technical and always very focused on this because it's one of the most complicated machinery. We are talking about ships that have 30,000 tons here or more. <laughs> I mean, this is basically spaceships for us nowadays in comparison. This is the most complicated stuff and and very, very, yeah, you can't just, okay, let's grab the battleships. Yeah, there's, there's not just the building issue and the next war, but also the education issue and everything else. Yeah, and uh, to, to feed back into this stereotype that like, oh, navies didn't care about F aircraft carriers. I mean, all the way back in 1921-22, they literally wrote aircraft carriers into the Washington Naval Treaty. Like they knew this was yeah. going somewhere, that this is going to form a part of their fleet, so much so that they wrote it integrally into the and restricted their tonnage in the in the Washington Naval Treaty. Now they were also they had also had a lot of other restrictions which kind of belay confusion around the aircraft carrier, but also um kind of the limitations of the class. But I think well we might circle back around to that when we actually get to aircraft carriers. Uh, one other thing to mention is uh, you mentioned the building holiday, which was actually imposed in the treaty. It was a 10-year moratorium on uh, capital ship construction, which meant that, of course, you couldn't build capital ships within this 10 years. Um, from memory, I think the, f uh, the French or Italians, or both, I can't remember what, uh, exactly, they, well they, they could have built earlier, but uh, they opted not to anyway. So... So there was this huge gap, which is why it's kind of like hitting the pause button, is what the Washington Naval Treaty did. Because you're looking at some of the designs of battleships uh, that were being kind of cooked up in the late 19-teens, early 1920s, and they're pretty... I mean, of course, the technology wasn't as advanced, but their capabilities were comparable to what you would see... Uh, coming out of designs from the late 1930s, because it's kind of that pause button was just you know, they pushed play again. Ah, so so basically, one of the the motivation behind the naval treaty was um, to prevent an, another arms race, like that happened in mm -hmm. the in the in, in the early twentieth um, century, or also in the nineteenth century, between United Kingdom and Germany, or British Empire, and also because well, there was a bit of a recession going on after the first world. War. Is this correct? 
Yeah, there's a there's a whole and there's this yeah there's this feeling that like you know never again because of course there's this, this post war optimism, and they identify like okay this naval arms race thing, that was one of the major causes of the first world war. Let's not do that again. Of course, the British are broke now. It's it's often often a common misconception that the the Americans are actually the ones that call for the Washington naval treaty. Hence why it took place in Washington. Because the the, uh, the U.S. they want to become a great naval power, but Congress wants to become a great naval power on the cheap. They don't want to have a giant super arms race with the British. They want parity with the British. If they can kind of institutionalize it in uh, some kind of treaty system, but so that they don't need to be they spend as quite as much money. And of course, they don't build up to their treaty limits either. So that's why the British uh, the Royal Navy remains uh, the largest. And the British, of course, they're strapped for cash. They don't really want to get involved. They'll do it. They're perfectly willing to, you know, they're already starting to design their next generation and starting to want to pump out ships. But, you know, reason kind of takes over and they're like, okay, we need to slow down this whole arms race thing. Uh, the Japanese, it's complicated, but the Japanese are kind of the same way. Uh, they're pretty much bankrupting themselves. Trying to main, uh, trying to constantly pump out bigger and bigger, newer and newer ships. The French and Italians, uh, the French come into the Washington Naval Treaty in a terrible negotiating position. Uh, their navy is largely obsolete. They're, of course, they fought much of the First World War on their territory. Their their industry is in tatters. They've got domestic problems. Uh, so what ends up happening is they kind of get screwed in the uh, Washington Naval Treaty. It's a, it's an under because people so f fixate on the big three, Japan, Britain, and the U.S., but also uh, the French and the Italians, of course, they have a great rivalry in the Mediterranean. And it's a disaster. Uh, the, from the French perspective, the Washington Naval Treaty is a disaster because the Italians kind of waltz into the, tr once, waltz into the negotiations and they walk out with p literal parity with the French. Oh, yeah. It's just... Um, it was crushing for the friend. The Italians were really happy. They kind of just wandered in and they just had it handed to them. <laughs> like, oh yeah, here's here have parity with your primary naval rival <laughs> institutionalized in a treaty. So, so as uh, far as I remember, the Royal Navy, the U.S. Navy had a parity. It was five five and three for the Japanese. Is this correct? Yeah. So, um, so the the famous ratio is five five three one point seven five one point seven five. Ah. So five for the yeah, five for the British and Americans, three for the Japanese, and then 1.75 for the French and the Italians. And those are the only five signatories of the treaty. So sometimes you'll see people that are kind of get confused uh, regarding, say, Germany, uh, the, the, the yeah, Germany and the Soviets. Are all yeah, the German. Yeah, the Germans have their own set of restrictions, which we probably will circle back around to later. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so now we can finally move on to, to the battleship. So we've kind of alluded that certainly during the 1920s, the battleship formed the core of the fleet. Pretty much, this is like, you're not going to be able to form the center of the fleet with the carrier. Yeah. As things start to, technology starts to advance and thinking starts to advance through the 1930s, this starts to become a more and more serious question. However, of course, we know that intellectually, the, these, in, these naval institutions, they still think, okay, the, the center of the fleet is going to be the battleship. These are going to be the final arbiters of... The naval engagement, you know, big guns, big ships, blah, 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 blah. We've all heard this before. By the time we get up to World War II, uh, as you do a very good job of in the uh, the video, and I really like how you actually structure when you like pre-war thinking of what this class is going to do versus what it actually does. And of course, one of the most famous example of these mistaken uh, conceptions was with the battleship, where... They thought they were going to be the ultimate arbiter of naval power, that they were going to win the war in, at sea, and they were going to form the center of the fleet. And then, of course, it ends up being, oh, I guess they're going to be a more they're going to be a supporting element, and the, the center of the fleet will now become the aircraft carrier, as we know. So that was a major subversion of expectations. At, uh, at least so Ryan for, the, for the Pacific, a fan. because. Uh, I I realized when doing the video, yeah, for the Pacific that's true, but but in 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 the Atlantic it actually wasn't, but mainly because <laughs> Germany had no had had a very limited amount of ships. Well, and that, that's another thing is that it's often seen as uh, you see it come up over and over. It's oh, carriers made such an, all these ships obsolete. It's like well, no, they didn't. 
so much make them obsolete as they it rejigged what was going to be the like the very center the the offensive heart of the fleet versus what was going to be supporting and it's kind of they just kind of swapped roles with the battleship it's not that the battleship was instantly obsolete because in fact if you actually look at naval operations even in the pacific the battleships actually were relatively useful they were doing things uh people always point to the yamato class of course it, that's more uh, fuel, a lot of stuff, you know, fuel allocations and, and, and them hoarding their resources rather than the ships were useless. The ships were useless because the Japanese Navy didn't know what it was doing. It was not, it wasn't because the ships were literally useless. Um, they could have been used earlier on if they'd really wanted to in a more useful way than they ended up being, which was basically a, just a glorified uh, headquarters for the combined fleet. Uh, but anyway, you know, you see in the Mediterranean uh, battleships being used. In fact, there were a lot of, uh, if I recall correctly, the Mediterranean theater saw the most number of uh, like cert, like classic surface engagements between gun ships. Uh, of course, that this was rarer, although it still occurred in the Pacific. But you see in the European theater, in particular the Mediterranean, these ships exchanging fire. Uh, you see, of course, you get you get into it. They're doing naval bombardment to support landings. They are helping in convoy escort. Uh, they're f uh, the decide the sheer, sheer size of battleships meant that if they were, with the caveat of if they were fast enough to operate with the carriers, they could serve as quite powerful anti aircraft batteries. Just because you could shove so many anti aircraft guns onto pretty stable gunnery platforms. So they did find uses, it just wasn't what they had thought pre-war. I think you've uh, done a very good job of kind of summarizing that quickly in the in the video. Thank you. Um, yeah, and there should be added, for instance, um, as you pointed out, the Yamato, it was not rarely used, but due to full restrictions, and the same was in the Mediterranean, because the Italian fleet, for the most part, couldn't be used, also because they had a lack of fuel. Yeah, that's one interesting, because people always poo-poo the Italians generally, but I mean, some cases rightfully so. And also, I've seen a lot of heavy criticism of how they use their fleet. But from what I see it, like their usage of the fleet as a fleet in being, and then with very sparse, I mean, it, looking at their actual logistical restrictions, that's probably the way to do it. Because I mean, the British, they were, they had to actually consider that at any, at any time, maybe the Italians would sortie. Yeah. Because the Italians couldn't just constantly sortie and attack. Uh, they were the one, they were the weaker power, and two, they had all these fee restrictions. So it's like, at least in that very specific instance, they used the fleet really as a fleet and being as, about as well as they could. You know, another famous example being the Bismarck versus Turpitz, in that, oh, yes, okay, everyone talks about Bismarck and Sorty and oh, how ground it is. And it's like, okay, well, it, it caused problems for a short period and then it got sunk. Whereas Turpitz sat in a fjord and took, soaked up more British resources than Bismarck ever dreamed. So, so, yeah, you know, there's different ways of using naval power that doesn't involve just sailing out and shooting at things. Yeah. <laughs> it can be the threat of it sailing out and shooting at something. And uh, I think um, Rader, the, the the head of the Kriegsmarine before Dönitz, um, he also uh, he saw this, I think, out of the First World War, that a few ships that the Germans had, or back then they had way more, but they draw away so much from the Royal Navy that he still thought the surface fleet could be used to draw away quite a lot of resources. And I mean, they did, for instance, with the Admiral Graf Spee, which, um, and, and as such, that the, the parity was, was offset. And if you look, for instance, I mean, one good example for this are the Malta convoys. If you look at how many ships the British put in there, I mean, one convoy had five. Okay, it was an exception, but five aircraft carriers as escort. And they, they sometimes had, I think, up to four battleships there escorting the convoys as well. And this, this also yeah. this seems because there's the threat of the Italian Navy and, of course, also the Luftwaffe and the Riga Aeronautica. Yeah, I... Um... I've mentioned this before on the Discord, but I don't think I've ever mentioned it in a video, is that like outside of the Pacific Theater, I find the Mediterranean Theater absolutely fascinating. And I think a lot more people should probably read up on it if they're into naval history, because like those great convoy battles of like watching the British Navy like pushing through heavy, heavy air opposition 
from the Regia Aeronautica and particularly from the Luftwaffe. I don't, uh, what was the specific unit that was trained in against shipping? I can't remember. Uh, a Fliegerkorps uh, 10, I think it is. 10? At least, at least that was in Norway. It's it's a Roman 10 X. Oh, okay, I think yeah, but uh, so it's very interesting. I mean, uh, Operation Pedestal, for example, I think that's the one uh, that was the big one with the five carriers and. Uh, you you see them operating together and defending the fleet from heavy air attack. Uh, they're, they're taking hits. It's actually a, a fascinating subject. And there's uh, there's actually free resources people can actually go to read up a little bit about it. Uh, Armored carry the Armored Carriers website. I want to give him a shout out because he does very methodical archival research. He edits together um, archival footage and stuff like that. And he's really into these operations in the Mediterranean. Uh, if anyone wants to, uh, just Google that and have a look. We'll put a um, link in the description as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He's a he's a nice guy. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter too, actually. Um, anyway, so I think that's a, that's a unless you want to add anything else to the battleship. I think that the battleship. I think you, you've done a very good job uh, summarizing because it's pretty pretty simple to summarize in in a very short period. So we can probably move on to the aircraft carrier. I think it'll be funny to see some of the reactions from people who realize that the C and CV <laughs> stands for cruiser. And that goes back to, of course, yeah, because they, they're trying to think of, how, well, what, what the heck do we name these things? Uh, these these two-letter designations, they come from the U.S. Navy in the early 1920s. I can't remember the exact year. So they're thinking, well, okay, well, I guess an aircraft carrier, it's role, I guess, it's to scout. Okay, so cruiser, cruiser scout. It's like, well, it has flying things on it. Well, okay, so I guess V uh, for flying things. Okay, sure, whatever. Let's go and knock off for lunch. Warum not um, CF? I mean, for flying <laughs> in, in English. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they use the French, I guess, to be pretentious. <laughs> but um, so, it, and there you kind of see in the thinking at this time. And I mean, uh, one fun fact: uh, a lot of the early, pre-reconstruction and early aircraft carriers, they actually have fairly heavy surface armament. And when you look at the restrictions in the Washington Naval Treaty regarding aircraft carriers, they're saying, look, you have they actually limit the gun size on aircraft yeah. carriers because what they were afraid of was people creating so, you know, quote unquote aircraft carriers that also had battleship guns on them or something to get around the treaty. Ah. But um so, for example, Hermes, which was the, the first British uh, purpose-built aircraft carrier, initially Admiral Beatty uh, wanted 11 six-inch guns. Uh, eventually, the final design would end up with only six. But like you're looking at the, these early concepts of carriers that were going to operate with the scouting cruisers, because, of course, the carriers are also scouting. So, therefore, they need to defend themselves against enemy cruisers. <laughs> Or, or destroyers or whatever, because they're going to be operating right up at the front. Also, aircraft have extremely limited ranges. In fact, early on, some of the aircraft ranges, I mean, they're so slow, particularly with ordnance, that they would be operating within range of battleships, which, which is one of those other things that people are like, eh, why didn't they replace the... It's like, dude, the battleships can literally shoot at them. Um, yeah, that's so hindsight, yeah. warrior. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, so and these very and I mean it, this isn't unique to the British or anything like that. Uh, the the early construction, uh, you know, the uh, Akagi and Kaga, they both had eight inch guns. Uh, the Americans, the Lexington class, they had eight inch guns. So they're they were thinking like, okay, we're going to have to defend ourselves from surface ships. Uh, of course, as aircraft performance increases and as thinking uh, advances, eventually they realize that they don't really need this heavy surface armament because. Of course, they're going to be operating so far back. And also, if you're in a surface engagement, these guns aren't going to help you because you're an aircraft carrier. You're hopelessly underprotected. If you get hit, you're you're far more susceptible to take catastrophic damage than a, a, a warship that's been designed to actually slug it out in a surface. So, so three, PG two. and Evans noted that in, in their book, Kaigun, which I highly recommend, and I think you as well. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful book. That... The Chicago class were 1941 superior to any carrier in the world than in commission. So, you know. Yeah, I bet you'll probably get you'll probably get some angry comments. <laughs> so, so what, what what is your thought on this? I there it's my favorite class of carrier. However, and it's they were superb for the time. Saying they were like without a doubt the superior to any other carrier in commission at that time is you can debate it. Uh, you. you you, frankly, you'd be an idiot to say, oh, they're bad, which I'm sure there's somebody out there. 
I mean, it's the they, did, they just hit they just hit the they just hit the unsubscribe button. But um, th- they weren't bad. They were very good for the time. But then you look at, for example, the Yorktown, which is also an excellent design. Uh, you look at the British. I'm for, I'm less familiar with uh, all the all the British aircraft carrier classes. Kind of blend together in my brain. So I can never think of which one's the exact contemporary of but, but the British aircraft carriers, of course, they're very different, but they are also quite good. I have the same problem with with, with British post-war tanks. It's all just C. It's one <laughs> tank. <laughs> <laughs> they have really they have really cool names. Like I love British naming conventions yeah, yeah. where they like name them after uh, after all these like like all these cool words and everything like that. But in my brain, they kind of blend together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, the the British arm, of course, go a very different route. But, um, with the armored carriers, uh, um, with the armored carriers. Dra- Drachifinel, or Drachifinel did a did a very good video on this. This is one of the very few history videos I watched completely on YouTube, and he, he really okay. makes the point why armored carriers made a lot of sense for the Royal Navy, basically because they were operating in the range of land based aircraft for the most time, and yeah, it and when also you, shows. When you s- that during the the battles that the hits they took the big bombs from the Luftwaffe they survived which probably the Japanese and the U.S. Navy probably had no chance in surviving. Oh, undoubtedly. I when you look at like the actual and again the armored carriers website he goes very methodically like through the damage reports and like exactly what was hitting them and everything and it's like they've taken a very impressive amount of punishment and keep going. Where when you look at uh, the American or the, the Japanese carriers, they would have, you know, when they're getting hit by huge bombs <laughs> from the Luftwaffe, I, when you look at the catastrophic damage even a 250 kilogram bomb hit can do to an American carrier, or uh, you know, a 500 kilogram bomb hit can do to a Japanese carrier, it's like you imagine them getting smacked with like a big Luftwaffe. Yeah, well, uh, I think they were, I think, yeah, like 1,000 kilogram or something. It's like absolutely apocalyptic. And then when you look at the impact, for example, of, uh, of uh, special attack, kamikaze attacks against British armored carriers, and it's kind of, you know, I guess the joke is kind of, it's, you know, sweepers, man, your brooms, yeah. uh, because you can actually see, you know, just a little dent and then aircraft wreckage and a little fire. <laughs> and thus, whereas the same kind of hit would cause major damage to an American carrier. And I mean, and it's not just that, oh, the Americans, Japanese are bad. It's just they're, where they're operating in the Pacific and they want to maximize uh aircraft capacity and there, there's a lot of other problems with uh there's lots of trade-offs between having an armored flight deck versus not having an armored flight deck and of course the japanese were moving in the exact same direction as the british yeah uh, with the taiho class i mean basically the idea is to kill the enemy before he can hit you so you you focus more on the offensive but since the british were operating too close to land bases they couldn't be they couldn't avoid to be hit so they put a lot of armor there and I think post-war, basically, I think they also switched more to a less armored variant, but uh, but they also took some some ideas into this. So Drachvinel concluded basically that there was a mixture of both, but more on the offensive, offensively constructed way after the war. Yeah, because they, I, the Americans, if I recall, in the midway class moved toward more armored, and then of course the Japanese had moved toward more armored even before the Americans. So yeah, there's there's lots of pros and cons there. Um, as far as the role of the aircraft carrier, of course, this is a this is the one that sees probably perhaps some of the most development because it's brand new technology really after uh, during the First World War. And it kind of evolves, and then toward the end of the 1930s, it evolves exponentially uh, with increases in aircraft capability and the displacement of aircraft carriers. When you look at the just the, the capabilities between, for example, a torpedo bomb, the average torpedo bomber in 1940 versus the average torpedo bomber in 1934, it's like night and day <laughs> as far as how capable they are, uh, with the exception of the swordfish, uh, which I know the British like. And the swordfish for me is like the poster child of raw technical characteristics don't matter as much as internet warriors often think yeah uh, it's it's a maxture uh, you know because when you look at the swordfish it's like it doesn't stack up particularly well against contemporary aircraft but then when you look at the combat record of the swordfish it performed wonderfully yeah and also it so, was very versatile i mean it, it was also yeah. n- uh, night flight uh, able and everything i don't know exactly why i guess because it was rather slow as well because I tried to find this out several times why it is able for night combat. 
but I never ever found anyone stating why. Do you know, I know why? The, I know the British were early adopters of airborne radar for surface search, but I don't know if they put them in the swordfish or if it was other types of aircraft. I'm not I'm not like a super well read on the on the fleet air arm. So I assume um, it was basically also I guess it had a very low stall speed and everything around this, mm-hmm. so, which allowed for easier use for landing, for instance. But I guess I guess the, mo- the, the one of the major problems with carrier based aircraft is landing. Mm-hmm. And and the Royal Navy trained very hard at night, and I know That's they could why, yeah. a, a lot of their a lot of their carrier aviators, if not all, I'm not I'm not sure, but I know they did actually a lot of them could operate at night, and I mean most famously, of course, at Toronto, uh, they uh, they torpe- that entire attack was took place at night, which was uh, very impressive actually. I mean, and then the results they got were also very impressive. Um, but overall, so of course they were thinking, okay, well, carriers are going to scout. They're going to operate in a supporting role of the fleet because, uh, again, I've just and I've described this in other videos. But the thinking is, okay, well, okay, we're gonna use carriers to scout. It's like, okay. However, how do we deny our enemy scouting? Okay, well, we'll put fighters on the carriers to shoot down their scouts and to make sure our scouts can't be shot down over the enemy fleet. Okay. Then, as technology advances, they're like, okay, well, why can't we use planes with ordnance that could be launched from the carriers? And then they're like, okay, so now we're getting, but at this point, the battleships themselves, they're probably too hard of a target for the carriers to really sink on their own. The the, the technology just isn't there yet. However, their aircraft carriers are vulnerable. And what's an easier way of denying the enemy air control than to just sink the source of it, the aircraft carrier? So now you have like, it's kind of carrier sniping in (laughs) world warships parlance. (laughs) Then. As, as technology continues to advance, they're like, okay, well, now we can damage battle fleet and maybe slow ships down or, or you know, maybe sink a, a handful, but for the most part, slow them down so that the battleships can, the, can catch up to them and finish the job. And then, of course, as technology advances further, and by this point, we're pretty much into World War II, they come to the realization that at this point, finally, the, the, the carriers, the planes, the doctrine, everything is in place where we can just sink ships outright at very long range. And that, that, so it, it completely changes, or not so much complete, it's kind of a gradual change yeah. through the interwar years into the war. And then it finally forms that main striking force. But of course, they also do perform a scouting role, uh, a supporting role, uh, anti-aircraft, anti-submarine, uh, all, all those things you list. I, it was a very, very versatile uh, way of projecting power. I mean, initially, you should add that the British tried anti-submarine warfare with the fleet carriers, and I think they lost at least one, and then they realized, okay, maybe it's a bit expensive to use one of those. Mm-hmm. I mean, this later, which we'll cover, led probably to the, to the development of the escort carrier as well. And you very interesting brought up this, you begin with scouting, and then you begin with, okay, we also need to deny the enemy scouting, so anti-scouting. And if you look at the development of planes in the first world where it's exactly that at first you have scouts then the scouts realize we need to shoot down the other scouts then they develop fighters and then they develop bombers and then they develop mm-hmm. strategic bombers so so this development circle probably will at some point maybe in space i don't know happen again like yeah yeah it's a very similar kind of progression so i guess we could probably move on to the uh, battle cruiser yeah, to the which is cruiser. probably the, probably the most interesting to talk about. Yeah, I, I, I had actually a line in the original script which I cut out. The battle cruiser actually the 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 most important or the, the longest legacy of all ships because up to now probably one hundred thousand of pages of forums are filled up with discussions. What is a battle cruiser? What not? <laughs> and everything, especially That's about so the Shanoas and nice now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I and cut I guess, it out then for okay. Let's keep. <laughs> And I mean, one of the root causes of that is because, as you as you mentioned in the video, by the, by the 1930s, and I, I, again, this video is of course focused on the World War II uh, designations as they existed in that war. The, the battle cruiser as a concept had kind of eroded by the time World War II came around because you had advances in propulsion, advances in all these different technologies that meant that you didn't need to sacrifice significant amounts of armors to also have good speed. You could have, this is the concept of the modern fast battleship, 
which was really starting to come out even as late as the late 19 teens and into the early 1920s you kind of see with uh, newer designs they're still being designated as battle cruisers but then when you look at their actual armor layouts and uh, their armament and their speed they're m starting to really more resemble kind of all round fast battleships i mean even hood you could uh, had a very similar armor profile to the battleships queen elizabeth class so you know hood gets this reputation for being thinly armored but that was well for one thing that's the deck armor which is actually just a a, a a byproduct of the ship being designed before uh, the lessons of, in fact, when you look at literature and, and uh, modern literature, but also literature from the time, they're talking about pre-JJ, post-JJ, or uh, uh, pre-Jutland, post-Jutland. Yeah. Uh, I mean, most of them were scrapped, I think, from the Admiral class because they were happening during the, the Jutland happened and then they scrapped most of them. And Hood was, I think, the only one completed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so th there's this in uh, there's this distinction because of course at Jutland you finally had these ships shooting at each other and there was a lot of lessons learned about armor profiles and and what was working what wasn't working, so that was kind of more important distinction really I would argue than battle cruiser battleship. However, at that time you still see I mean immediately post war a lot of the designs cancelled by the Washington Naval Treaty. Um, for the Japanese, you have the Amagi class; those were battle cruisers. And then they were meant to be paired with the Tosa class, which were battleships. However, really past that, I mean, even before that, the Nagato class, I would argue, were the first modern fast battleships, at least as we understand them, because they actually had quite good protection. They were very fast for the time, and they had very good armament. They were, they're very well rounded. And then when you look at, uh, for example, the key class, they're designated battleships, but then you look at their speed, they're almost as fast as the Amagi class except they just have more armor. And you can already see that like the, the birth, the, the beginning of the, the modern fast battleship, and this isn't just the Japanese, I'm using Japanese examples because they're the ones I can pull out of my brain instantly. But you see this progression kind of uh, among pretty much all the naval powers because the technology is advancing to a point that the, the original concept as, as envisioned by Jackie Fisher of the battle cruiser is starting to lose its relevancy. However, where you get all these debates about oh Shornhurst, uh, what about uh, Dunkirk, what about you know et cetera et cetera, is because now you're trying to find definitions for what is a battle cruiser with ships that were really quite well rounded. I mean, when you look at Shornhurst, okay, it's underarmed because it's complying with the Versailles Treaty at least nominally. Mm. Uh, not 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 as far as displacement goes, but as far as main battery goes, I should specify. So it's limited to 11-inch guns, oh, but yeah. it's very thickly armored. Uh, it's armored like a battleship. It's a, uh, the hull is a battleship, basically, a fast battleship. But then the guns are only 11-inch, so people go, it's a battlecruiser, because it's underarmed. And I mean, when you go back to the First World War, the German concept of a battlecruiser was slightly different from that of the British. Like, you know, the, the, the British, most famously, it's thin armor with the same guns as a battleship, uh, faster. But the Germans, they tended to sacrifice a bit on their armament have a bit thicker armor for a battle cruiser and then still be f a bit faster so they were giving up on armament so then you can look at the shornhurst class and go i guess it, it's kind of like that same lineage ah, okay of no, I the guess german so. concept of a battle cruiser but then you can go th then you have people come back and go well look at that armor look at the it's clearly a battleship i mean they they were talking about of course swapping out the turrets for for 38 uh, gun, centimeters, 50, yeah. Yeah, 38 centimeters. So it's like, okay, well then at that point, of course it's a battleship. And so you can have these endless debates simply because it's such a fuzzy concept by the time you get into the 1930s and particularly by the time you get into the late 1930s and into the Second World War. And I would say, well, you can have to debate, but in the end, the carrier came around. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and it's, I guess one thing I really should note is one of the things that one of the nails in the coffin of the battle cruiser is that under the Washington Naval Treaty, and this is also telling of the time too, there was no distinction in the Washington Naval Treaty between a battle cruiser yeah. and a battleship. They were lumped under all capital ship tonnage. So under the under the rules of the Washington Naval's uh, the Washington Treaty system, they were capital ships. It doesn't matter if they were a battleship or a battle cruiser. So even even all the way back in the early 1920s, they're already starting to go. Why are we really focusing on these these distinctions 
and of course, the, I mean, the intended role um, as you get into is it, it's actually the one that kind of lines up perhaps most with <laughs> its original envisioned role. So next is the heavy cruiser. For this, we chose the Prinz Eugen. All right. So yeah, the heavy cruiser, um, one of my favorite ship classes, actually. And as we understand it, by the time World War II comes around, as you as you point out, this is a distinction that was actually created with the London Naval Treaty in 1930. Um, and simply because, of course, there was a loophole in the, in the Washington Naval Treaty where they were taught, they were so focused on getting all these tonnage restrictions and, and restrictions in place for capital ships and aircraft carriers that they kind of phoned in the cruiser side of things and smaller. So with cruisers, they all they did with the Washington Naval Treaty is restrict them to 10,000 ton standard displacement and no larger than eight inch guns. So all it did was, well, we the navies went, well, we can't build capital ships anymore. Let's just start let's just start pumping out as many of these big treaty cruisers as we possibly can, particularly with the Japanese. So cruiser the Japanese spam. Went, yeah, the, the Japanese went nuts because they started to envision, okay, well, we can't have this many capital ships. We're always going to have an inferiority in capital ships. Let's just pump out all of these, essentially, what were conceptually like little baby capital ships. <laughs> That they were they were going to use these very uh, these treaty cruisers to try and somewhat even the odds, and I mean they pumped out a lot of them so much so that the Americans were quite alarmed. And actually, uh, the treaty all these treaty negotiations and everything are, are very fascinating. I, I won't get into too many specifics, but that's one of the main reasons why the London Naval Treaty came up is because of this arms race in cruisers. So they create this distinction, as you point out, between a heavy cruiser, even though they don't call them the heavy cruiser in the treaty, but just cruisers with guns that are larger than 6.1 inch and cruisers with guns that are less or 6.1 inch or less. And there is, as an astute observer will note, there is absolutely no rating in the treaty regarding armor protection. So you can, so a Pensacola, for example, which is, in fact, they were nicknamed by the press cynically uh, tin clads because they were so poorly armored. These were technically now redesignated heavy cruisers because of their gun caliber. It had nothing to do with their level of protection, which is why when you're when you're watching like a World of Warships video or something from somebody who's not maybe that attuned with naval history, and they're like, "Well, it shows it's a heavy cruiser, but look at this armor; it's so bad." It's because that distinction has absolutely nothing to do with the armor protection. It's all about the guns, yeah. Yeah, that's just how they they wrote the treaty, and of course, since the treaty doesn't actually specify the language, uh, people call them all sorts of different things. Uh, heavy cruiser is kind of the, the one that, I mean, the U.S., of course, uses that. The Japanese have a, a class system. They say um, type A is a heavy cruiser, and then type B is a light cruiser. So, yeah, so, this is basically along the, the naval treaty because it has A and B written there with the subcategories. Mm -hmm. So they were most closely resembling treaty. I actually look at a German booklet here. Propaganda booklet, what they noted about the cruisers. If they said, I think they also said light and heavy. Schwere and unleichte Kreuzer, yeah. And they, okay. And they refer to the to the loan. And we also should note there are two London Navy uh, treaties: the one from 1930 and the one from 1936, which I think was the the German British treaty, right? No, it was uh, it was another full naval conference. Ah, um, what ended up? Ah, uh, where, where the mm -hmm. Japanese walked out? Was it this one? Uh, yes, and the Italians. Uh, so this is the one where it, 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 it complicates things further because they wanted to further restrict uh, warship, uh, particularly capital ship classes. Uh, they this is the one that imposed, for example, the uh, it imposed a restriction on the gun caliber for capital ships to fourteen inch, which is why you get, for example, early North Carolina design concepts have a 14-inch design concept, uh, KG-5. This is part of the reason why KG-5's development history, of course, is very complicated. But um, why the 14 inches in that consideration, because they're like, well, it has to impo uh, fit within that treaty. But there was also an escalator clause within uh, the second London Naval Treaty. So because the Japanese and the Italians end up walking out, that means the escalator clause is ops, uh, automatically implemented for signatories of the treaty, which mean, uh, which increases the displacement limit on their battleships up to 45,000 tons and their gun caliber up to 16 inch, uh, just as a, a random factoid. <laughs> <laughs> 
I guess one thing we should we should talk because we, we you used um, Prince Eugen as a uh, as an example heavy cruisers. We can briefly mention British or pardon me, not British uh, German restrictions on the navy. Um, at least a couple of them, and that is that they are not a signatory of the Washington Naval Treaty. However, the Versailles Treaty uh, people obviously for uh, focus mostly on the army restrictions in the Versailles Treaty, probably understandably because of course Germany is. We're now just in power, power. land power, um, but there's restrictions on the naval side as well. And one restriction so far is pretty much that they cannot have a ship larger than ten thousand tons or with guns exceeding eleven. And there's a, uh, eleven inch in caliber. There's other restrictions too. Uh, there's like a they can't replace a ship that's such and such years old or whatever. I, I can't remember without having the text of the treaty in front of me. But this is where I, I wanted to come back around to briefly mention the Deutschland class, because that's another one of those, of course, great debates. And this is where is that under the Versailles Treaty, the Deutschland class were capital ships. They were replacements for Germany's battleships uh, that under the Versailles Treaty, because they have 11-inch guns and they're 10,000 tons displacement. What made them so surprising to the British is that when the British had originally thought up, or, or when the Allies had originally thought up this restriction, what they envisioned was basically they were trying to limit the Germans to building crappy pre-dreadnoughts. What the Germans did was, okay, screw you guys. We're going to build a cruiser with battleship guns. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was what made them so novel. But under the Versailles Treaty, they are capital ships. And in fact, even though they aren't signatories, under the Washington Naval Treaty uh, system, they are capital ships because they have guns in excess of 8-inch, meaning that they are no longer classified as a cruiser they're classified as a capital ship under the washington naval treaty as as far as raw capability goes they're basically just overgunned heavy cruisers yeah basically the, the germans called them panzerschiff which is mm -hmm. armored ship and during the war they reclassified them as heavy cruisers from what i mm -hmm. yeah because as far as capability goes like getting outside of the legalese of various naval of various treaties i it's it's like a heavy cruiser hull with eleven inch guns. <laughs> so and, heavy and cruiser, of, probably. And of course, it didn't have a ten thousand displacement. They, they said they yeah, have it, but yeah. it didn't have it. So it's like, yeah, yeah. Which uh, uh, that's like a whole other discussion is people cheating or fudging with. Um, and of course, most famously, it's the Japanese get singled out for it. Uh, the Italians do it. Uh, in fact, the Italians do it properly. Uh, the the Japanese do it stupidly <laughs> well what do you mean with properly uh the, the japanese they try to stay within treaty limits but then they impose requirements on their designers that make it impossible to stay within them so what you end up with are ships that have a lot of problems because they're designed to fit within ten thousand tons standard displacement but they have the capability of ship larger than that so they go over the limit, but not really intentionally, and they get a lot of problems and have to reconstruct them and fix them. Whereas the Italians, they literally sit down and go, okay, this treaty stuff is just crap. We're going to literally just lay out a, a, a requirement to just break the treaty blatantly. <laughs> so they did it right. They broke the treaty, and they just they designed it from the ground up to break the treaty. And that was with the uh, Zara class. And, uh, and it's not just the Axis powers, too, that are fudging. Uh, the British actually fudge with uh, the Nelson class as well. Just uh, not in a huge way, but the way their protection, their torpedo protection system worked, it, re it relied on seawater. And with the wording of standard displacement, as you guys heard, it's part of the protection system. However, in the displacement calculations for uh, the Nelson class, they excluded the water and the torpedo protection system in those calculations. So it's kind of cheating around the edges of the treaty a bit. Did, did the French cheat as well? Uh, not to my knowledge, at least not intentionally. In fact, uh, uh, as a fun fact, the, the French are regarded as the most, uh, they produce the most successful treaty cruiser design. As in, it actually was very well balanced. It wasn't overweight. It wasn't underweight. It, wasn't, it didn't have any major problems. And that was the uh, Algerie class. Or Algerie was a standalone ship, I guess. That that was is typically regarded by experts in, in ship design as the best of any of the powers. And and without even breaking the regulations. So the others built yeah. built worse ships and they broke regulations as well. Yeah, I, they were trying to shove more capability onto their ships oh, than okay, yeah. like the, yeah, like the the Japanese, they were just I mean, it got to the point where with the Mogami class it literally burst at the seams. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<laughs> um, they, they just couldn't, they were just trying to shove too much in. And I mean, once they, and, and you'll hear people going, oh, well, all their Japanese, all the ships sucked in the World War II. They actually didn't. They'd fixed them by then, but that's because they'd had done a whole bunch of extra reconstruction and everything to essentially bring the ships up to the displacement they should have been in the first place by reinforcing the hulls and adding, <laughs> fixing all sorts of stuff. Um, anyway, I guess we can move on to light cruiser. Here we have the light cruiser. We have the Cleveland because it was the most mm -hmm. used light cruiser. And I think it's also sometimes called the USS Flamethrower in World of Warships. <laughs> it's a terrifying ship, that's for sure. So yeah, light cruisers kind of performed... I mean, most of their roles, other than the scouting, uh, cruisers never really panned out as scouting, with the minor exception of Japanese, but then the Japanese cruisers for scouting. Yeah, uh, this is, for example, uh, Oyoto, which was yeah, Tone, which was a heavy cruiser actually, but it was a scouting yeah. cruiser essentially because uh, if people don't know the the entire aft portion of Tone, it's actually my favorite cru uh, my favorite cruiser personally. I think it looks so cool because it's just so weird looking. It's like literally just a a deck for um, launching float planes for scouting with, and they were designed specifically to operate with the carriers to just supplement uh, scouting. Anyway, so yeah, light cruisers, uh, they kind of did their, you know, uh, floating AA batteries, of course, was a, was a popular use. Uh, f forming as destroyer leaders, particularly as the uh, for the Japanese, uh, that's what they're... And the Japanese, they really badly neglected new cruiser, light cruiser construction, and then when they did build them, they were, again, very, very small. They were purpose-built destroyer leaders. Um, the Japanese also had one, Oyoto, which was a submarine flotilla leader. Uh, which what? is quite interesting. Yeah, because it was it was worked into that concept of the submarines as a fleet weapon. Ah, well, was it with so, this with these small submarines with two torpedoes, and it was a mothership? Uh, no, they, they, it was it was meant to lead big fleet submarines to scout for them and to operate as the headquarters for the submarine flotilla ah. to coordinate them their actions against uh, the enemy battle line or whatever. It, it's so it's one of those concepts that, of course, never really. Um, in fact, what Oyoto ended up doing is because it had such wonderful command spaces, it would serve as, uh, I think, the last headquarters of combined fleet at sea <laughs> would be in this little light cruiser. And as, I guess I should mention dual purpose guns, because uh, a lot of people probably will go, oh, a lot of them didn't have them. Well, yeah. And but almost everyone tried. I mean, I think literally everyone tried. I know the Japanese tried, the Americans tried, the British tried, with varying degrees of success. And it really wouldn't, of course, come to fruition, as you say in the video, until really the end of the war into post-war, where finally they could actually get guns of that size to shoot fast enough and track fast enough that they were relatively usable as anti-aircraft weapons. And of, and of course, there's other exceptions, like, of course, the Atlanta had all destroyer armaments, so... Yeah, she was basically built as a, a float, uh, as destroyer leader because I was quite surprised. I thought at first she was built as an um, anti-aircraft cruiser, and then, oh no... Yeah, that's what, yeah, because people, again, and tend to get sucked into hindsight is that they ended up being very useful as anti-aircraft cruisers, but their initial conception was, well, they're just going to lead destroyer flotillas. In fact, I think they do so in some of the night battles, my memory's fuzzy, I think they did act in that role in some of the night battles of Guadalcanal. I think it was also, I think, wasn't it not the, the only U.S. Navy cruiser that actually had death charges on it? I'm not I'd be surprised by that. I'm, I'm, sure. I'm not entirely sure or something, but I, I think Conway mentioned it, but it was not not really that maneuverable anyway. And this reminded me actually, I think there's an error in 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 Hearts of Iron Free because with 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 cruisers, with light cruisers, you get uh, anti-surface warfare capabilities usually, and I think that's not pretty accurate. But it's just a minor aside. So let's move to the escort carrier. Yeah, and these ones. Uh quite crucial for the allied war effort they use them very um oh there's a typo in the video oh no no cv <laughs> oh anyway. no oh no yeah no, no, yeah you'll just have to put a little correction in probably yeah anyway um so yeah these were very i mean and i mean you cover it very well in the video they they really form kind of the back the unsung backbone of uh allied kind of naval power i mean they they support landings which of course frees up the big carriers for more important duties they're they're convoy escorts which again frees up big carriers and they're far cheaper 
you know, to operate with various convoys. They ferry aircraft to various island garrisons. They, they do all sorts of stuff. They were absolutely indispensable to the Allied war effort. The Japanese had a handful of them that you could class as a CVE. Some of them were, in fact, one was a Japanese army, uh, Akitsumaru, and I think they had another one. Uh, which was originally an amphi- the world's first amphibious like assault ship. Oh, nice! However, it was converted to uh, a C- what was essentially a CVE for convoy escort. So they 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 used them in a similar way, but uh, uh, of course they had very very few of them. The the Americans they pump these out like <laughs> like yeah at, on a level that is awe inspiring. <laughs> I think the Casablanca class is the most constructed uh, carrier. Ever or something. I'm not entirely sure. Oh, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, the, they they produced a lot of them. and They did a lot of work. Do you have any idea why it is equipped with one five-inch gun? Uh, I have no idea. I mean, Morale, I sus- maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I, mean, I suspect I mean, shooting at a submarine, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Or, you know, or providing at least some limited a- a- increase in anti-aircraft capability or... I guess it's better than not having it at all. Because one, but, I mean, it's like usually you have at least two or something, but one, I, I mean, I, I guess it can barely cover a, a complete area or something. Yeah, kind of mm-hmm. fun. Let's move to the destroyer now. This is a rather new ship class, and I always ask myself why this called destroyer. And well, the background is it was developed originally to counter torpedo boats. There were several counters to them and the torpedo boat destroyer was basically the winner of this yeah so the the progression of the destroyer of course is originally it starts out as the torpedo boat destroyer and over time kind of gets they get bigger and bigger and they start doing more and more and more things and by the time you get to world war ii they of course are jack of all trades they're being produced in huge numbers they're doing like everything you could possibly imagine i mean they form because they're they're just absolutely indispensable to the fleet, and now the some nations draw further distinctions within their destroyers, like uh, the French. They have um, oh, I'm not even going to try, but I, they have something that I think roughly translates to torpedo boat destroyer, and which are big fleet boats. And then they have the or they have these other ones that are they call fleet torpedo boats, which are kind of more emphasized on, of course, well, torpedoing things. So, so they, they they draw this um, this distinction between slightly you know smaller fleet torpedo boats to torpedo things and then bigger ships to kind of shoot at other destroyers and then but they are both really to an outside observer would be classified as a destroyer but it, so there's there's lots of like fuzziness there. Um, yeah. The Germans the Japanese, also had, had very large torpedo boats. They had the E-boats, which were the small ones, mm-hmm. but they also had very large torpedo boats, with the, which they called torpedo boat. And I think they're probably similar to the French ones, I assume. And I, I guess one thing to note is that uh, what's regarded as kind of one of the first quote-unquote modern destroyers, and I mean modern by the standard of like what we would expect in World War II, would be the Fubuki class uh, from the Japanese. Uh, which was a very forward-thinking design at the time. That they were designated special type by the Japanese. Uh, they were much larger than preceding destroyers. They had uh, they had enclosed turrets for protection against tra- shrapnel and weather. Uh, the, so they were they were kind of the first big, well-rounded, what we would think of as a modern destroyer. And in fact, it came as quite a shock internationally when these things uh started peering up other navies sat up and took note i mean if you think at this time uh, the u.s navy had kind of gone nuts with building all of these four stacker destroyers uh through the first world war and toward the and immediately post-war so they had like (laughs) piles of these old destroyers and then the navy kind of shat a brick when they saw these like this new generation of japanese destroyer that's far far more capable and then they went to Congress and they're like, hey, we need to build like stuff like this. And Congress is like, well, you just built like hundreds of these other things that we paid for. We don't want to give you any more money. <laughs> so, so there's like all of this uh, screaming and panic. Uh, however, that's not to say they were perfect because, uh, you know, because it was a Japanese design, uh, they tended to. And this is actually in the destroyer class, they were particularly vulnerable to this. And the Americans were also guilty. Uh, 
they had top weight problems with their destroyers, uh, like the Fletchers and, and uh, some other designs, particularly as they kept adding more and more AA to them. But uh, the Fubuki class were quite top heavy uh, because the Japanese were so ambitious with just shoving as much crap into them as they possibly could. <laughs> Yeah, always um, top heavy. I think it's, it's usually <laughs> every Japanese ship. Yeah, it was top heavy. <laughs> Check. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not not literally, but definitely for the these Fubuki class, they were uh, they had to be reconstructed quite extensively in the in the mid to late 1930s uh, to kind of reinforce their hulls and uh, try and fix some of these problems. I mean, the worst ones by far are the Hatsuharu and Shiotsuyu class because. And we won't get into this, but there were restrictions actually imposed in the London Naval Treaty on destroyers as well. And the Japanese are like, well, no, we want the same, basically the same capability, but just on the smaller displacement. So when you see the original design of uh, Hatsuharu class, where they've got a super firing five inch gun over top of over top of their number one turret, and it's like you don't need to be a naval engineer to take one look at that and go, okay. You're gonna have top weight problems, <laughs> um, and in fact, they had to reconstruct them and move that turret aft uh, on the Shiotsuyu class, uh, which is what is or uh, Shiotsuyu and Hatsuharu class, which is what you actually see in uh, World of Warships for those people that play it. And, and Hatsuharu with World of Warships is a reconstruction where they remove that turret, but uh, Shiotsuyu in game still has it. Other than that, I don't think I have tons to add on the destroyer. I mean, uh, one aspect I should add, which is, for instance, f from the from the missions, from the many I mentioned, there was also they were, for instance, coordinating for the U.S. Navy um, combat air patrols against kamikaze planes during your, the invasion. So, with the, with the combat information center and everything, they were also coordinating planes, fighter planes, oh, in the air, okay. and also also. So basically, they did everything. I mean, they could engage surface air and submerge targets. Basically, I think they were the only fleet-capable ship that could do this. Basically, they could engage everything. Yeah, they they were very, and I mean, there's distinctions too because, uh, for example, the Japanese they tended to lean toward producing what were essentially very large fleet torpedo boats, where they were very focused on anti-surface capability. Um, their anti-submarine warfare capability was not the greatest their anti-aircraft was not the greatest uh so they were kind of skewed if you think of it kind of as one of those triangles you know the japanese would of course be quite skewed towards surface combat generally speaking yeah that you know they carry torpedo reloads that on later models could actually be reloaded in combat quite quickly which was quite exceptional and they also had uh, the leading torpedo yeah they had a, a very capable torpedo quite famously of course um so, you know, there's all these distinctions. I mean, of course, I think at least that I can see the, the best, like you used the Fletcher class, which I think is the, you know, it was the most produced. It was very well balanced. You know, it had pretty capable anti aircraft, it had capable anti surface, it had capable anti submarine. It was kind of, it was kind of like that's what you think of when you think of a World War II destroyer. And I think in some cases they replaced the one turret there in the middle. With with a boat, yes, with addition, yeah, with additional AA, yeah. Because well, you, at, at that point in the war, you you can't have enough AA usually. <laughs> All right, I guess we can move to the uh, submarine. Yeah, let's move to the submarine to the Type Seven C of the Kriegsmarine. So this is where I have to admit that I'm not the biggest submarine guy. It's one of those things where I don't have like an overriding interest in submarines it's kind of grown on me over time but uh and there's there's a whole bunch of debate of course over submarine usage uh you know that the germans at least to my knowledge didn't really have weren't under any illusions as far as submarines as a fleet weapon they were using they want they really were envisioning them as to use against shipping yeah commerce shipping. Radar basically and also uh, the, mines to a certain degree but also for commerce rating mainly and the, the, Whereas the U.S. and the Japanese, they were following that that fleet support doctrine. Of course, on famously on literally the first day of the war, they got, received orders to launch unrestricted submarine warfare against Japanese shipping, and of, and the Americans had quite a learning curve to develop this because, of course, they'd been trained to engage fleet targets. They'd been trained to be a lot more cautious, uh, etc. There were lots of um, other issues. So a limit early on, their success was quite limited because of this 
pre-war conception and they had to kind of learn how to really go after shipping in the most effective way possible. Uh, and the Japanese kind of stuck with this fleet concept. They had very mild success, but not anything to write. In fact, they had about as much success as you would ex as really the U.S. did. I'm mean, probably less success than the U.S. did because the U.S. submarine force sank an embarrassing amount of the Japanese navy. You know, the Americans they're like, oh yes, we switched to, to attack merchant shipping, but they also sank a lot of big fleet units and and destroyers and all sorts of stuff. I don't know how much success off the top of my head the Germans did. I mean, I know they sank some, but I don't know. I don't know how yeah, many numbers in my they, head. They sank at least one one battleship in the Mediterranean, and then they sank at least one one fleet carrier in the Atlantic early on. Then they went into Scapa Flow. Preen went there and and sank the Royal Oak. So yeah, but but for the most part they focused on merchant shipping. And actually, <clears throat> the, from what I read, I think the the British originally wanted to ban the submarine completely in the Washington Naval Treaty, yes. but the Italians and French at this point noted, I think, that for smaller navies, they could use them as a defensive weapon. Mm -hmm. so also yeah, they were, they were vehemently thing. against. Uh, in fact, this would be a, a thread that kind of ran, like the British really wanted to get a submarine ban in. Uh, they would try again to. And of course, everyone, because the Japanese, it was so integral to them because the Japanese viewed it as, look, you're already short shifting us on, or short changing, I should say, on capital ships. We need these submarines to like, you know, and in fact, the Japanese investment in submarines pre-war is very heavy. And then, of course, the French and the Italians are like, uh, no, we're not giving up, you know, this, this kind of asymmetric aspect of naval power so that the British can stroke their, their capital ship erection. They... <laughs> they um it, it was kind of a dead on arrival proposal yeah and i guess i should mention that uh they were used also for supply particularly by the japanese and this is this actually is a major because usually you always hear okay they didn't attack merchant shipping too much they did do it a little bit but not really any major concerted effort so you hear that distinction but what you what really there's this fundamental shift as the war starts to really go south toward using their submarine force to uh, supply islands that are cut off or about to be cut off or are very vulnerable. And of course, this was a very, very dangerous task. And their submarine losses were very high, and the submarine force thought it was a complete like waste of resources. Um, I haven't read all of the, the stuff I've gathered on it quite yet, so I can't go into more depth than that. But it's one of those uh, interesting features that uh, a lot of people I see kind of don't really think about initially. I mean, what's also very interesting, the Japanese Navy, nearly all navies went to one or at most two submarine types. Whereas the Japanese mm -hmm. Navy, I think, were all over the place. They had very small ones to very big ones to something in between. Whereas the Germans, for instance, had mostly the, the type 7. And then they had a few mainly you could long range boats. And, and that's about it. And then, of course, in the Pacific, you have longer ranges, so longer range ships. Our longer range submarines for the US Navy and, and Imperial Japanese Navy. And also the, the Italians had a rather large ships as well. Do you know anything about the Italian Navy and the submarine warfare? I only know that the few ships the Kriegsmarine got from them or they were supporting them, the Dönitz was just, you don't do anything, guys. You just, you're not <laughs> helping, basically. It was, this, uh, this is the, I only read, but, but then I read up a bit and I was like, they had really big ones, and 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 they had the second most number of 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 submarines when the Second World War broke out. The the most had the, the Soviet Navy had the most submarines when the Second World War broke out, followed by the Italian, and then by the by the U.S. Navy. So everyone thinks about the Kriegsmarine, but actually the Soviets had the most. Do you know yeah, anything about this? Because they um, also started very late building them. They started, I think, in the 1920s or something. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't speak to it too much because, as I mentioned, I'm not a big submarine guy. But, uh, yeah, I guess that's all I can say on that. <laughs> I guess I need to find someone who, who knows something about the Soviet Navy and this. Because this always was like, yeah, but I never had time to read it up. I always stumbled across this and then... Uh, yeah, yeah, they I had a, they had a the very game. massive, they had a very massive, ambitious uh, naval building program leading up into World War II. Of course, World War II kind of threw hand grenade into that, uh, but they were building. They had very, very ambitious plans, and I know they were generating a huge number of submarines. Ex exactly what they did during the war or yeah. anything like that, I, 
I can't say. I also know, I think, one incident, but this was in late war in 1945 when, when they sank one, one of the refugee ships. This is basically... Oh, yeah, the famous one, yeah. Yeah, but, but this is like, okay, you started off with 160 submarines in 1939. <laughs> and, and the Kriegsmarine was not all over the place, so what, what happened to them? It's kind of like, maybe they were all really old, like, because for the tanks, we know a lot of the... The, the Soviets basically started to build tanks too early, and they had so many tanks that when the Second World War broke up, most of them were obsolete. Maybe this happened with submarines as well. So this could mm-hmm. be the, the thing why or we are just ignorant. And they did a lot of stuff, and I don't know where. I think we covered the submarine. So let's mm-hmm. move to the last one, and probably most unknown class, at least from the comments, the destroyer escort. Yeah, these are another unsung hero. They built gajillions of them. Yeah. And yeah, they were just escorting uh, convoys, which was absolutely indispensable, uh, doing a whole bunch of anti-submarine warfare type stuff. Um, famously in the Atlantic, uh, and this is quite famous, I should say, for like Canadians and things like that. It's a point of pride. We made a lot of them. We used a lot of flower-class corvettes uh, to es- assist in escorting uh, Atlantic convoys. But destroyer escorts, of course, were far more capable than those little uh, flower-class corvettes. And they did a a similar job, and they did it well. Um, It's not a universal class, as you mentioned in the video, because, for example, the Japanese, they they have a couple ship types. You know, they have, like, what I call desperation destroyers, these late-war destroyers um, that are bigger than a destroyer escort, but kind of roughly have the same, or maybe slightly higher capability um, so that, it, that we kind of lump into destroyer escort, and then on the other end they have boats that are smaller, a uh, kaibokan, and they are they've performed the exact same role as the destroyer escort, but they were a bit less capable than a destroyer escort. So we also lump them into this category. So you know it, it wasn't a completely universal class, as you mentioned. But those of the Japanese were they, um, I think some of them were capable of fleet actions so they were faster yeah like the the desperation destroyers as i call it were actually they might have been comparable in speed because i mean this is the main de- determining factor i think for this royal yeah. escort and, and escort carriers if you look at them they can't keep up with a fleet so they're always with the for instance with the slow battleships um the the u.s navy they, they got back from pearl harbor basically the salvaged and everything but they can't operate with the fast battleships or with the carriers yeah, so like for example, the Matsu class, which was uh, one of these uh, late war or mid to late war desperation destroyer classes, it went about twenty seven to twenty eight knots. So it could so it's keep it's, up. It's, more yeah, or less. it's very marginal. It's faster than a destroyer escort, but it's quite a bit slower than what we would consider a modern destroyer to be. Yeah, but uh, beyond that, yeah, that's that's about it for destroyer escort. I guess uh, we could briefly mention that, of course, this isn't a, an exhaustive list of ship classes. There's there's tons of really small stuff uh, that's not mentioned in the video. There's lots of logistical stuff. You know, there's seaplane tenders. There's oilers. There's all of these uh, different classes of ships. Submarine tenders. In fact, there and there's goofy types of ships that people were cooking up in the interwar years under these treaty restrictions, uh, like the the infamous uh, like. Fl- flying or like carrier cruiser hybrid weird things that were yeah. cooked up in the U.S. Navy. Um, so there's there's tons of stuff that we we didn't talk about. But, you know, hopefully this is at least serves as a a, a modest introduction to the subject. A recommendation: um, check out the channel Drachfina. If you're more into naval history, focuses exclusively on ships. So I hope this uh, served as a relatively informative introduction to at least some of the ship classes of the Second World War. Uh, if you ever want to look at more, you could probably pull out whatever giant book, you know, Conway's fighting ships or whatever, and dig through pages and pages and pages of all these tiny ships and big ships and supply ships and <laughs> everything to your heart's content. But uh, Yeah, I guess we'll probably end it here so that we don't put everyone to sleep. <laughs> So big thank you here, Justin, for helping me out on the main video and, of course, here. So Yeah, and, no problem. And you all know where the, where the comment section is for questions and angry comments. How dumb we are. <laughs> 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 thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.